Thank you so much. Um, it's so incredible to see everybody here from all over the world. Uh, we have really come quite far in, in Norway, in the Nordics, in Europe, uh, in the world. This is um, really exciting and inspiring. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Um, uh, yeah, and for, uh, unfortunately, Celia uh, broke her arm uh, and uh, was in a morphine daze uh, at least the last 24 hours. So, um, so I'll talk about the similar topic uh, and cover some of the information from the, the CARE trial, which she was going to uh, present. Um, so, so I'm going to be talking about ketamine for the treatment of substance use disorders. Um, in the, I'm, I'm an emergency physician uh, by background. Um, and in the last couple decades in emergency medicine, uh, I've seen hundreds, hundreds of people die from uh, substance use disorders, uh, mostly alcohol, opiate disorders. Um, you know, I've helped save some people's lives, um, but often it was the same person coming back and uh, again and again to the emergency department uh, after relapse, um, which is to say that, you know, we, we have some treatments that are available, but um, the, the kind of standard outcome is, is relapse. And... Um, uh, so there's a huge need for, for better, better treatments. Um, ketamine has primarily been used uh, for depression in, in the field of uh, mental health. Um, and over the last uh, six, seven years, I've uh, done thousands of, of treatments um, for uh, the treatment of depression with ketamine. Um, and there's, there's actually a lot of overlap uh, between substance use disorders and depression, uh, both in that there's this you know, fundamental um, of being stuck in uh, maladaptive, negative patterns of thinking, feeling, or behavior. Um, and there's also a lot of comorbidity uh, between, between the two. Um, I'd like to read a quote from Edgar Allan Poe, who uh, died of his uh, alcoholism. He said, It has not been in the pursuit of pleasure that I have periled life and reputation and reason. It has been the desperate attempt to escape from torturing memories, from a sense of insupportable loneliness, and a dread of some strange impending doom. Um, so, as uh, Matthias pointed out, uh, the global burden of um, disability-adjusted life years uh, from uh, substance use disorders is very, very high, um, particularly in, in um, uh, particularly with alcohol, tobacco. Uh, interestingly, you know, there's a lot of focus on on illicit drugs when we talk about addiction, but they're they're actually a very small uh, percentage of the the total. Uh, burden of disability uh, in the world, somewhere around 4%. Um, so ketamine is a uh, NMDA receptor antagonist. Um, it was uh, first synthesized in 1962 as an alternative to PCP or angel dust um, as a better anesthetic. Um, it was FDA, it was first tested on prisoners in 1964. Um, and even at that, uh, just in that first uh, healthy control um, uh, study, they, they noticed that uh, people had uh, positive effects on their mood after, after the uh, single dose of ketamine. 
It was uh, FDA approved in 1970 and, and approved in Norway in 1973. It's one of the most commonly used medicines uh, in the world on the World, he uh, world Health Organization list of essential medicines. Um, it, just recently, um, a couple years ago, a Brazilian group found that um, ketamine is also uh, produced naturally in the uh, fungus Baconia uh, chlamydia spora. Uh, there's a theory that perhaps it's, uh, it's used for, it, the, the fungus uses it to disable parasites in the roots of, of plants as a, uh, uh, in symbiosis. Ketamine is um, a very unique, interesting drug. In fact, it, you know, there's a whole class of uh, medicines, disassociatives. Um, uh, the, the, new, the new class was, was coined because of how different ketamine is. At very low doses, uh, it just has an analgesic effect. It helps pain, but no psychoactive effects. Very high doses, it's a disassociative anesthetic. We can do surgery. They don't remember the experience. And it's this middle range, uh, the sub-anesthetic dose that um, has psychedelic properties that appears to be the most effective um, for the treatment of mood disorders and, and addiction. Um, so, so as I said, we, you know, uh, most of the research that's been done in the field of mental health has primarily been uh, focused on uh, addiction, uh, sorry, uh, uh, depression. Um, but the, the history of uh, using psychedelics in uh, the treatment of addiction is actually quite, uh, quite long. Um, as uh, Matthias pointed out, um, you know, in the 1950s, Humphrey Osmond, uh, he treated about 2,000 patients in, in Canada uh, using LSD for uh, alcohol use disorder and reported a, um, uh, about 50% uh, response rate, which is quite remarkable. Then what happened was in you know, 1970, um, all the psychedelics were made illegal initially in the United States and then uh, globally throughout, through the United Nations. 1970 was the year that ketamine was approved by the FDA. So it, it sort of became one of the only uh, uh, legal uh, medicines with psychedelic properties. So uh, many people actually continued using um, ketamine in psychotherapy, uh, what we call uh, psycholytic therapy, so sort of uh, lower doses, uh, but also psychedelic um, higher dose uh, therapy uh, in Central America, in Iran, and uh, later in Russia. So in, um, in, in St. Petersburg, Yevgeny Kripitsky uh, was using ketamine to treat um, people with uh, severe uh, alcohol use disorder. Uh, he found that just giving a single dose of ketamine, um, they had one year uh, abstinence of 66% uh, versus 24%. This was replicated by a group at Columbia, uh, Elias Dakwar, um, 40 patients in a randomized controlled trial. Uh, one dose of ketamine plus mindfulness-based uh, relapse prevention, um, and they found six-month abstinence of 75% versus 27%. So really positive uh, results. Um, the largest study that's been uh, done so far by uh, my colleagues at Awaken, um, Celia Morgan uh, and, and her colleagues, uh, 96 patients with severe alcohol use disorder. Um, 
And in the, there was a ketamine group plus mindfulness-based relapse pre prevention. Um, there was ketamine plus psychoeducation, and then uh, placebo. Um, they found, this was a relatively, uh, these were people with a relatively severe alcohol use disorder who, had, who started from just 2% days abstinent uh, to, and at six months, there was 86% uh, ab abstinence. Um, here's uh, uh, a graph showing uh, the results at three months and, and then at six, six months. So really profound, uh, profound effect and, and durable. And the other interesting thing about this trial that supports some of the other uh, uh, data that's been done is that it um, shows that the addition of the psychotherapy in in this case, mindfulness-based uh, relapse prevention uh, had a significant improved uh, benefit over um, uh, psychoeducation. Um, so there was in the in the care group there was two and a half times uh, less decreased likelihood of relapse, and another important thing is actually you know. <laughs> So not just days of drinking or you know percents, but but that the predicted mortality of these people was uh, a tenth of or a tenth of what it would be predicted based on their liver function at the beginning of the trial. So the um, the AST, one of the the liver enzymes, um, actually not only improved initially, but actually stayed improved over the six-month uh, period. And they, you know, based on those numbers, you can, you can predict what your one-year mortality is. Um, so that's a, a, a significant real clinical outcome that is important to the, the lives of these people. Um, another interesting article that was, uh, that was done uh, recently also in England, um, in 2019, um, an RCT with uh, ketamine plus what they called reward activation. Now, these, these were uh, college students who, or university um, students who sort of by definition all have alcohol use disorder. And um, uh, so they weren't severe, but they're, you know, basically binge drinkers. And what they did is they, um, instead of just giving ketamine, they activated the maladaptive reward of uh, expecting to get a beer uh, before, right before the ketamine treatment. Um, and those, by a when they, the ones that had the, that activated reward memory actually had uh, uh, significantly improved outcomes compa when compared to the group where they didn't do that. Um, so it was even better than ketamine. And they, and they hypothesized that there, you can actually reconsolidate maladaptive rewards by bringing this up, activating it in the brain prior to um, uh, the ketamine experience. And they had, at the end, at six months uh, after this treatment, um, uh, a half of the amount of units of alcohol that they were doing before. Um, so ketamine's been studied for heroin. Uh, Krupitsky, uh, back in St. Petersburg, uh, showed that a single dose of ketamine plus uh, psychotherapy, um, uh, the, this was a two-year follow-up, 17 versus 2% abstinence. And he also showed that if you did repeat uh, sessions with the ketamine, uh, you could get significantly improved outcomes. So a one-year abstinence of 50% for heroin um, addicts is actually really Im impressive. Um, now, we don't have any good uh, therapies for uh, uh, stimulant use disorder, um, and uh, Doc War's group um, had, did several trials in uh, 2014, 17, and the most recent in 2019 on um, a placebo-controlled trial with, with ketamine 
also with a mindfulness-based uh, uh, relapse prevention psychotherapy, um, showing decreased likelihood of relapse, uh, significantly decreased craving scores, um, and uh, 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 increased abstinence. There has been a pilot study for cannabis use disorder as well, uh, just a small uh, pilot. Um, but in this uh, small pilot, the days of use, so people using cannabis five days a week, went down to, at six weeks, about a half a day per week. Um, so that is also very promising. Cannabis use disorder, although not very prevalent, is, uh, is also something where we don't have a good pharmacotherapy uh, for. Um, and finally, it's been um, studied preclinically in rats, that self-administration um, in male rats uh, of nicotine goes down quite significantly uh, after, after ketamine. Um, those sex differences we don't uh, really see in, in human uh, uh, clinical trials, but uh, it's interesting in, in rats. So, you know, we don't know a lot about the, uh, the mechanisms of, of, um, of, of how ketamine uh, and ketamine-assisted psychotherapy uh, actually functions with addiction. However, um, we, there's a, a lot of good hypotheses, and we have a lot of information from the work with uh, depressed patients. Um, so, so one of the mechanisms is uh, ketamine uh, stimulating, uh, sorry, blocking inhibitory GABAergic interneurons, which then inhibits the inhibitor, which then increases glutamate in the cortex, and then preferential uh, stimulation of the AMPA receptor, finally increased BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, uh, stimulating the cascade of neuroplasticity, neurogenesis. This is a picture from the Yale group showing a rat that got ketamine, and you see new synaptic spines forming just 24 hours after a single dose of ketamine. And this translates to, so, you know, increased number of, of connections between, branches and connections between the brain cells uh, for the people, translates into increased cognitive uh, flexibility, uh, resilience uh, in their thoughts, their emotions, and, and behavior. There's also normalization of dysfunctional electrical networks. So ketamine uh, normalizes the hypoactivity that we see in the prefrontal cortex in chronic stress states. Um, there is normalization of the default mode network, so increased, instead of hyperactivity and the rumination being stuck in the, the self, um, there's a shift in the balance towards more of presence, more of a flow state, just being here now. Um, it also, ketamine um, blocks, the, blocks and uh, sort of resets the anti-reward network. People are familiar with the reward network. You get dopamine, uh, positive feelings when you get food or sex. When with the anti-reward network has the function of doing the exact opposite, of uh, punishing you, and has negative uh, outputs to dopaminergic and serotonergic areas. And this is adaptive if we're in a stressful situation or say we go out to the forest and we try to find food, but then there's no food. Um, we need to be punished, we need to adapt our behavior and go to a different forest. Um, but when there's chronic stress, when there's childhood trauma, when there's uncertainty, when there's, you know, in, in, there's a constant uh, fear that the alcoholic father is going to hit you, um, instead of turning on or off, this, it's sort of like the thermostat is always just set a little too cold. Um, and ketamine normalizes the, the function uh, here in this anti, in the lateral habenula. 
Um, there's also evidence from the depression research uh, that ketamine decreases um, hypertrophy in the nucleus accumbens, and um, uh, hypertrophy uh, in the nucleus accumbens is associated with um, with uh, craving in uh, in uh, substance use disorders. So. Finally, there's the um, psychological aspects of uh, ketamine, um, the experience, the phenomenology of uh, the ketamine experience. Now, from the, the, most of the research that's been done on ketamine in psychiatry has been coming from a, this neurobiological perspective. It's a medicine. It has all these neurobiological effects, this is how it works. Um, and the entire experience has been viewed as a side effect, as disassociation, as psychotomimetic, uh, uh, looks like psychosis, you know, a, a, a side effect that we're trying to get away from. However, uh, we have increasing uh, data and clinical experience to suggest that it's actually the experience can be really important, not just to the, um, to the response, but also the durability of the response. So, um, you know, people can have alterations in their perspectives, uh, they can have insights, um, they can have consolid like reconsolidation of, of traumatic events in their life. Um, there's something called the overview effect, which comes from astronauts, which is this, when you step out, when you step back and look at things from the bigger perspective, you get a different perspective on, uh, on your, your problems, your life. You know, the first time the astronauts go up into space and they look down at the Earth, they know that there's war and there's suffering, there's all this stuff that does exist, but in the big picture of the universe, of the stars, everything, um, it, it helps kind of recalibrate their um, uh, connection uh, to those problems that, are, that, that do exist. Um, now, you know, the, the concept that, um, that a, a single uh, positive experience lasting for about an hour you know, how can that actually change somebody's chronic uh, addiction? Um, it, it seems hard to believe. Like, how can just a single positive experience do that? And yet, we have the, you know, we have this, we have uh, the experience from the inverse with PTSD. A single negative uh, traumatic experience has long-term changes on your nervous system, uh, on your entire life, and it can last for, you know, for, for a long time in a, in a negative way. And so likewise, you know, the uh, colleagues at Johns Hopkins uh, studying psilocybin have coined this term uh, inverse PTSD, that you have a powerful, mystical-type, meaningful, transformative experience that changes your life uh, uh, in a positive way. Um, and that's what we see with, uh, with, with ketamine. And I would just um, uh, end on one, um, just an example. So, you know, when a biological psychiatrist says to me, well, you know, I don't know if these, if these experiences really have um, such a major impact on, on uh, the, the positive outcome, just give you an example of um, a guy I saw about six months ago. He had a lot of childhood trauma, um, and his first experience, he first he dissolved into the universe, um, became one with everything, and then he was in the blackness of space, and he saw in, in the corner of space this black box, and it was floating, and he, he, he looked in the box, and in the corner of the box was himself as, as a six-year-old child just hiding from his alcoholic father. And um, he reached into that box and gave himself love and comfort 
and held him and said, it's okay, uh, you're okay now. And then he became that boy, everything turned around and he saw himself as an adult and felt the warmth and the love and the comfort. And, you know, you cannot hear that story and say that that wasn't an important part of his transformation that, that helped him get better. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Yeah.